Tonight, with the World Cup in full swing, Dispatches goes undercover to lift the lid on football match fixing. Is that result guaranteed once you speak to the referee? That is why we will get the officials that we have created their farms so that they will do it. We reveal the story behind the conviction of match fixers who try to infiltrate the English game. The England league is the cost is very high. Yeah. Uh, so usually for the players, the England league is seventy thousand pounds. How the highest echelons of the sport are now under threat. And no country, no tournament is immune um, from fixing. And we confront those offering to help fix a match involving a team competing in the World Cup. Good morning, gentlemen. I'm Morland Sanders from Channel 4 Dispatches. And you two guys have been trying to fix football matches, haven't you? I'm not on the field. I'm not the one playing. So how can you tell me that I can decide the scores of the game? Every four years, football throws a party. The biggest tournament on the planet. But beneath this glossy image promoted by the World Cup organisers, there's a dark world of dodgy football agents, bought-off officials and illegal gambling syndicates, all working to corrupt our beautiful game. Last week was the moment when English football fans realised that their teams weren't immune from the fixers. One footballer and two men with links to the Far East were convicted of plotting to throw results involving lower league clubs. It was two match-fixing investigators who provided vital evidence that ultimately led to those convictions. Now, they have shared their material exclusively with dispatches. And tonight, we tell the story of the global problem of football match-fixing. This is one of the men who masterminded those fixes, Chan Sankaram. He's 34 years old and from Singapore. And this is the man whose investigation helped sentence Sankaran to five years in jail. Former FIFA anti-corruption officer Mike Pride, who tracked him down last year following a tip-off. How did you reel in Chan? It was really quite simple. Um, I set up a, a Facebook page using an alias and um, put on that Facebook page that I was a football match agent. And how eager was he to respond to those messages? And what sort of information was he supplying and the answers? Oh, very eager, um, extremely eager, because he saw this as, a, as an opportunity uh, for wealth, for himself. And also, uh, you know, if we talk about the details in those messages, it was football matches, football players. Within hours, Sankaran was offering fixes to a virtual stranger. One message read, I know most of the team players from different clubs and countries. I will ask them to lose three or four goals per match. Like first half, we bet 200,000 euro, and the winning is about 180,000 euro. Was there anything in that conversation that thought, oh, this guy's just a scam artist? There was an element of that, and that's why it was important to hold meetings with Chan and follow right through. Um, to, to confirm that these guys could do what they were saying. A few weeks after connecting with Sankaran on Facebook, Mike's fictional character, Joe MacArthur, was about to meet his man in a London bar. Mike was posing as someone who wanted to buy a fix. Usually we do four goals, three goals. Four goals, three goals. That's what you're asking to lose. Yeah. Okay. Total goal, I want four goals in this game. Two, two, three, one. Doesn't matter. Strongest four goals. OK. And Sankaran wasn't talking about some low-end league in a faraway continent. He was promising English players if the money was right. The England league is the cost is very high. Yeah. Uh, so usually for the players, the England league is 70,000 pounds. At a later meeting, Sankaran would go on to accurately predict the result of an English lower league game three days before kickoff. 
buenísima. Siempre ves en cómo lo volviste. Just as Sankaran predicted, the match finished 4 0. By now, the undercover investigation was being run by Mike's colleague, also a former investigator with FIFA, Terry Steens. Why does the integrity of this sport matter so much to you? It matters because if we don't protect it, the game will just be undermined and then we won't have a game. Terry and Mike's investigation revealed that Sankaran was by no means a lone operator. One player is in Hungary, he's the main boss. Okay. Uh, he yeah. will decide everything which game that he okay. will say, okay, you go here. Okay. Right. Uh, so he's a Hungarian guy? No, he's oh. a Singaporean. He's Sing okay, right. I think you can go to the Google and check Wilson Raj. Wilson Raj. Wilson Raj. William Raj? Wilson Raj. Wilson Raj. Chan led Terry and Mike to one of the syndicate's main men, a notorious global match fixer, Wilson Raj Paramal. These are secretly recorded conversations Mike told us he had with Paramal. Paramal was part of a global fixing syndicate, and one of their favoured methods was to set up their own matches so that they could appoint referees and fix results. Terry Steens discovered this was how the syndicate fixed an international tournament in Turkey three years ago. When did you first get wind of this tournament in Turkey? UEFA called FIFA Security with concerns from the Estonian Federation that uh, they'd been paid in cash, which was unusual. The tip-off gave Terry a rare opportunity to see a fix unfold in real time, as this revealing footage shows. I saw two games between four international teams and seven penalty decisions, seven goals. And with regards to those decisions, what were the what were the supporters inside the stadium thinking? Not a lot, because there were no supporters. There were no fans? No fans. The stadium was pretty much like this, empty, but for maybe 60 people. You've got no TV rights, you've got no fans, I don't understand what the business model is here. The business model is to play a game out of sight and yet up there for betting. So the whole thing, the whole tournament, was purely for the betting market? And that's what it appears to have been, yes. As a result of Terry's investigation, FIFA banned the referees involved for life. So how does a fix like this work? Well, normally, if two nations want to play football, they will contact each other directly and arrange the game. But middlemen with a match agent can also approach one country, offer to pay for the match, and then find an opponent. The middleman makes his money on ticket sales and TV rights. These operators are known as agents or third-party sponsors, and it is entirely legitimate for them to put on a game but it's a system that's wide open to abuse by the fixers. Just last month, there was a police alert that a World Cup warm-up friendly organised in this way might be fixed. It meant that every incident in this match between Scotland and Nigeria came under scrutiny, including this unfortunate mistake by the goalie. With a warm-up fixture now under suspicion, Dispatches asked former FIFA investigator Terry to go undercover. His mission? To discover if it's possible to fix a match involving a World Cup team. His cover story is that he's a consultant for Far East investors who have gambling interests. We make contact with someone we'd come across when looking at player ownership for a previous dispatches. He suggested he could help arrange matches for Ghana's national team. Terry's about to meet him. 
you doing, Chris? Yes, I'm here in front of the carriages. In front of carriages. Let me come see if I can go and get you. Hello, sir. How are you, sir? Oh, Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Christopher Forsyth is a licensed player agent for the Ghana Football Association and he may be able to help us become official sponsors of the national team. Their results have been up and down in this their third consecutive World Cup, but last time they reached the quarter-finals and are still regarded as one of Africa's stronger squads. Forsyth gets straight down to business and discusses ways to make money out of sponsoring Ghana's international friendlies. I made an inquiry and realized it's possible, but you really need somebody on the FA who is very close to the FA president. Okay. So we needed someone who had close contact with the president of the Ghana Football Association. Fortunately, Forsyth had brought such a person along with him. This is Mr. Obed Ketia. Yeah. Um, he is the CEO of the Commission of Obed Naketia, CEO of a top league Ghanaian club and on the management committee of the national under-20 side. Here he is with Sepp Blatter, the president of FIFA. The way it works is that um, with the Ghana national team matches, yeah. uh, they have the FIFA this every year there, which we all know that mm -hmm. they are yeah. this. Yeah. That. So people lobby for the matches. Yeah. Now, if you pay, if you are able to meet it and pay, yeah. then you've got a match. Okay. Right. Wherever you want to take the match to, it's up to you. Uh, what Forsyth is suggesting is a legitimate business model. FIFA allows third parties to organise international friendlies, though what isn't permitted is for that third party to influence the appointment of referees. So we were shocked when, out of the blue, Forsyth suggests that our investors might be interested in betting on games where the referees can fix the result. In Ghana, the best thing the sporters want to see is seeing that the team has lost but it wasn't the fault of the players, but the official. <laughs> because I do it happens everywhere. Everywhere it happens. The referees can change the matches. Absolutely. Like, you can decide for them, you can decide for them, tell the officials, look, something is happening in Far East on this match, so we want it 3-2 in favor of the opposition. And then they will make it happen. So we can actually uh, just dictate the result that we want. Yeah. And that makes everybody happy. Exactly. Everybody wins. Exactly. OK. So that's what I'm saying. There is no way that we can lose if we decide to do this. Tournament. Terry plays along, yeah. indicating that we would be interested in such a proposition. Yeah. We know referees exactly. that uh, could be appointed to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> OK. Thank you. We agreed that Forsyth and Naketia would make some inquiries and get back to us. In part two, I travel to the Far East to discover how illegally bet billions are financing football fixes on European pitches. And we hear how getting the ref on side can be crucial to a fix. Is that result guaranteed once you speak to the referee? That is why we will get the officials that we have created their funds so that they will do it. Dispatches is investigating how to fix a football match. We've heard from people who claim they can order a specific result. We can decide for them, tell the officials, look, something is happening in Far East on this match, so we want it three to in favor of the opposition. And then they will make it happen. It appears there's a network of fixers the world over, but the finance for their crime flows through the Far East. I've come to Hong Kong, a centre of Asia's multi-billion pound betting markets. 
It is a Wednesday evening. It's been raining on and off for most of the day. Yet look around. This place is packed. More than 10,000 people here already. This is Happy Valley Racecourse in the middle of Hong Kong Island. And the fact that it's so busy is evidence of a near obsession for very many Chinese people. Gambling. £7 billion pounds was bet on horses alone last year in Hong Kong. But the amount of money gambled on horse racing is tiny compared to that being placed on football. Patrick Jay is a man who keeps a very close eye on Asia's betting markets. He explained the difference between the legal bets the jockey club offers and the so-called grey market on the web. We're offering Premier League, La Liga, you know, top leagues like that. Look at what they're offering. International friendly under 19 match between Indonesia and Myanmar. And you can see every now and then the screen is lighting up, showing that the odds are moving. Why are the odds moving? Because betters are placing bets. Okay. Why, would, why would the Hong Kong Jockey Club not offer bets on that match? We would have integrity concerns about that game. Integrity concerns? Yes. You feel it's not being... Both sides are not playing to win, is that I'm what you not, mean? I'm, I'm, no, I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is we wouldn't have enough information about whether they were, and therefore it's not something that we would be particularly interested in. So when you look at these things, it's very important to understand, you know, these guys are offering, the grey market is offering a number of very, very low-level games, games which aren't on television, which don't have a huge attendance, it's not very high on the popularity, who knows the players, who knows the coaches. We don't have the time or the resource to look into all of these games. And then, of course, if there are not many people watching them and there's no television, then there might be problems for integrity. I'm not saying for a moment that there's a problem with that game, but those are the kind of the classic games, yeah, which attract the attention of match fixers. That unregulated grey market is huge, but it is dwarfed by an illegal black market in Asia estimated to be worth a trillion US dollars. Money channeled through dodgy bookies operating at the end of a phone or the back of a pub. OK, we've been making contact with an illegal bookmaker and we've just had confirmation that he has agreed to meet us in about 10 or 15 minutes' time. Uh, it is very rare that these guys come out of the shadows, so it will be fascinating to hear what he's got to say for himself. The penalty for operating as an illegal bookmaker in Hong Kong is up to seven years in jail. This backstreet bookie only agreed to speak if he could keep his identity hidden. He told me about single European games taking bets totaling more than £7 million. <laughs> How much money can you make? Do you know people who can fix football matches? Did you make money on that game? If this man is to be believed, games involving famous English teams have been corrupted. I was understanding the depth of links between the Asian gambling markets and fixing on pitches in Europe. But what about a high-profile national side, one playing in the current World Cup? In London, our plans to become official sponsors of Ghana's national fixtures were progressing. Match-fixing investigator Terry Steens is undercover and is meeting for a second time Ghanaian football agent Christopher Forsyth. Hello, sir. How are you? I'm fine. And you? I'm good. 
He appears to be offering to help fix an international friendly for us between Ghana and the USA, who at that time were due to play each other in the World Cup. If Ghana beat them these three consecutive times, and then we organize a match in the States, they think Ghana will beat them. But we know what we're doing. But yeah. we will tell our backers that they should bet for United States to beat Ghana. So here's what's on the table. We organize a friendly after the World Cup between Ghana and the USA. But how would we bribe an officially recognized FIFA referee? Terry tries to find out more. Who takes care of referees for a game? Who I mean, do we? Do we? Yeah, I think because if we're doing the match, um, everything belongs to you. You have to arrange it. Because we pay, okay. we, we have to pay yes. the referees. Because so without arranging, how can you talk to the referee for you? Understand. you don't so we have to pay the referees. Is that result guaranteed once you speak to the referee? That is why we will get the officials that we have created their funds so that they will do it okay. the way we want it. That's what I'm saying, because yeah, yeah. officials, um, when they come, you, the, 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 the organizer, you have to take care of them yeah. to, after the match, and then they go away. So, so that is where everything happens, because there's going to be people you be walking okay. around. Uh, I'll explain that to her. I take you to South Regis and get you some nice things. <laughs> do the match for, and then do the match for me. Okay. They obviously go into it. Right. So we know the nitty gritty of everything. So those ones, no problem. It makes a lot of sense. So our business model is clear. First, we become an official sponsor of Ghana's national team. That allows us to organize their international friendlies. We can influence the appointment of match officials before bribing a ref to fix the result our way. And then we make a killing on the Asian betting markets. This was the business model fixing mastermind Wilson Raj Peramal perfected in the run-up to the South Africa World Cup in 2010. The tournament promotional video presented it as a proud moment for the whole continent, with fair play an important part. But behind the scenes, Peramal was trying to fix some of the warm-up matches. Match-fixing investigator Mike Pride says he secretly recorded Peramal admitting what he'd done. South Africa. I went to the South African Football Association, told them this is an African World Cup, so all the friendly matches, my company will support African referees, we will pay their airfare, we will pay them their this, and then we will pay them their accommodation, and they were very happy. So we brought in the referees, we wanted three goals in every match. I used referees and two linesmen to get the job done, very simple. I paid them 60,000 and we were betting up to 1 million. Mike's former partner Terry later investigated the game's Peramal influenced and reckons the fixes were obvious. Well, we had uh, South Africa, Guatemala, uh, South Africa win 5 0. When we looked at the video playback of the referee Ibrahim Chaibu, a referee known to us, known to be associated actually with match fixers, two of the decisions that he gave were just ridiculous two penalty decisions the uh, referee gives a, a penalty against the defender and the ball clearly hits him dead center uh, in the middle of the chest it's not a penalty and it's clearly seen on camera it's not a penalty and yet he gives it and he has a good view of it as well La gente de... La selección de Guatemala. the next penalty is outside the box it's a good three feet outside the box when the incident occurs, but he points straight to the penalty spot. Los guatemaltecos, otra pena máxima más también discutida. The South African FA admits it was wrong to hand over responsibility for appointing the refs to a third-party sponsor. Chaibu, the referee, has denied any wrongdoing. Now, when it comes to how to fix a football match, top of Terry's list, nobbling the ref. How does that fix work? It's quite simple. You pay the referee and you pay him for the result. Four goals or more, three goals or more on the Asian betting market, 
It's a good result, it's a good return. But there's a better way to guarantee the result of a game. Fill your team full of fakers rather than footballers. So the Bar NFA agree to have an international friendly with Togo, but what actually happens is a fake Togo team turn up to play that international friendly, not the Togo international A side. This Togo were clearly unfit and lost 3-0. Well, they were hammered and uh, pretty much out of breath after the first 10 minutes. But why fake just a team when you can fake the entire match? You get 90 minutes of commentary and bets on a fixture that never even existed. There is no game in effect, but the commentary for the game, a stadium is hired, there's a commentary, and it goes onto the, uh, the betting board. But there's another more sinister way to fix a football match, violence against the players. In another part of the world, they're much more aggressive and they'll show a gun or use a baseball bat or a hockey stick to give a player a beating to achieve the desired effect. Fixer Paramal once smashed the knees of a Singaporean footballer with a hockey stick. And Terry and Mike had made contact with one of Peramel's former associates. He gave a remarkable insight into the level of violence used by another fixer. And so you read this one meeting that night in one of the big karaoke uh, lounge. And I go there, and it's scary to look at them. These are gangsters, not police officers, people f***ing always with them. And they are his stuck. They are being stable. This boss still just talks like that. Yeah, the, 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 the captain of the team. This was my... First... He went on to explain how he had complete control over an entire international under-18s team, including the coaching staff. We had a set of team under, under, 16, under 18 team. Everybody was in on the money. The whole team. So all the players? Everybody. Oh, so from the general secretary? Yeah. Everybody. The instructions will be given from the fan, and we will tell them what to do, and then uh, the coaches will, will go out and, and shout the instructions. So who's in the stand? You guys. We were in the stand. And players just know that? Yeah, and then we, we, some of the games, we then had our own men sitting in the bench, like a reserve. Big claims. An entire under-18 international squad, apparently under the control of the fixers. Our plans to stage friendly matches for Ghana's national team were coming together. But we needed the endorsement of the big man in Ghanaian football. Association president Kwesi Nyantaki. He's a member of the FIFA Associations Committee and was a football organiser at the London 2012 Olympics. With his approval and that of an FA committee, we can become the official sponsor, stage Ghana's friendlies, then we will be able to control the refs to fix the game. But Terry gets an email from Mr Fixit, Chris Forsyth. He wants cash to help the deal go through. He claims it's money for the president and those on a committee within the FA. Both the cash and payment methods seem suspicious. For Scythe's emails read, Regarding the money for the emergency committee, it can't be paid to them directly. It can be paid to my company. We suggest £5,000 each for the four and £10,000 to the president, making a total of £30,000. We tell Forsyth our boss wants us to speak to the president directly. <laughs> Hey, Chris. Hey, hey, how are you doing? I'm good, you? Okay, not too bad, not too bad. Uh, just a quick word with the president and then... Okay. okay. Hi, good morning. Mr. President, how are you? Fine, thank you. We had sent Forsyth a draft contract with a crucial clause, saying our company would be allowed to appoint the referees, clearly in breach of FIFA rules. What would the president say? I had a discussion with uh, my two friends and they indicated they had a meeting with you in London. 
and you made some uh, declarations of interest in some businesses with the federation. So I advise that you could send us a proposal and thereafter we could schedule a meeting to okay. discuss the proposals and fine tune. I can't. I, I can't. Uh, I can't see anybody actually. Uh, okay. <laughs> sorry, Chris, sorry, sorry, Chris. Can you see me? Yes, I can see you perfectly. Well, thanks for taking the time, and thanks for uh, explaining briefly uh, what Christopher and Obed have uh, spoken with you about. Um, did they um, show you a contract that we proposed? They mentioned to me about the contract. But I believe that we should, we can look at it okay. uh, after we've considered all the proposals. Yeah. Okay, so you want to consider all the options, that's great. And yeah. then we could have a meeting to discuss it? Yeah, yeah, I'll look at it and then we can take it from there. Okay. Okay, John, I'll speak to you later, eh? Okay, all the best. Yes, Happy, man. be Bye. good. So Forsyth and Naketia have friends in high places, but the president says he hadn't seen the contract. In part three, we arrange to meet the president in Miami, where the Ghana squad are warming up for the World Cup. Would the president okay our contract that breached FIFA rules? I suppose to meet you. I wish you all the best for the World Cup. And we confront the men, offering to help us fix a match involving the Ghana team. Good morning, gentlemen. I'm Morland Sanders from Channel 4 Dispatches. And you two guys have been trying to fix football matches, haven't you? We've shown how match fixers have seemingly infiltrated every level of the world's most popular sport. How referees, players, results can all be bought by illegally bet billions flowing through Asia. Football admits it has a problem. The question is what are the people in charge of the game going to do about it? This place is home to UEFA and they look after some of the richest leagues anywhere in the world, but today they're discussing something that may stop football dead in its tracks. We aim to increase the cooperation in the fight against match fixing and all organised crime related to it. UEFA recently signed an agreement with Europol, promising football would cooperate more and share intelligence on match fixing. I met UEFA president and Euro Championship winner Michel Platini. He explained why football needed to stand firm against the fixers. How significant a risk to football is match fixing? I think it's uh, nice to begin to fight against, uh, against him, but uh, we have to, to take care of it. And it's why uh, we signed a, a memorandum of understanding with uh, Europol to protect. I don't think it's a, it's a great problem in the in the European football, but it can begin. It can become a great problem. You know, it's very it's very important for me because being a, a football lover, uh, it's uh, important that the game will be protected and uh, will be protected for the fans, for everybody. Because if you come to the game and you know the result. I think it's the end of the game. My understanding is that there are three solely tasked with sorting out match fixing in the UEFA Integrity Unit. This is a very, very wealthy organisation. Why not have 103 if you're taking <laughs> this very seriously? We take it very seriously, but we are not a judge. I am a guy who will take care of the football, but we need, we need the police, we need the service, we need the justice. We need, in each country, we need these people to help the football to fight against the criminality. While UEFA have made a big deal about their effort to take on the fixers, what about FIFA? That's the organisation in charge of the World Cup, a tournament promoted through glossy videos like these. FIFA declined to be interviewed by dispatches, but warned that football's biggest tournament is vulnerable. The fixers are trying to look for football matches which are generating a huge betting volume. 
and therefore the World Cup in general has a certain risk. If you are probably at the group phase, at the end of the group phase and you are already qualified for the next round or disqualified for the next round, then in this kind of match is more vulnerable than the final. Terry Steen spent two years working as a FIFA anti-corruption investigator. Ultimately, he felt the resources he thought were needed were not being made available. How many people were there dedicated to looking at match fixing within FIFA? Well, we had four investigators. Four? Yeah, just four. four for a worldwide problem? Four for 209 associations and a global problem, yeah. Come on, Terry, that's ridiculous. No, it was a start. It was a start and a step in the right direction. But once we realised the problem, once FIFA realised the problem, then they could have resourced it and gone at it with more manpower. FIFA declined to confirm to us how many match-fixing investigators they now have. Terry's former colleague, Mike Pride, also recognises the initial effort FIFA has made, but believes more can be done. Well, I think there's been um, some progression and some positive steps forward with the appointment of uh, integrity officers, integrity units uh, globally. But um, the real challenge is how to gather significant or pertinent information um, proactively to prevent fixing and not act after the fact. Our investigation to expose the fixers in football is taking us to the doorstep of FIFA's most prestigious tournament. Terry's on his way to meet the Ghana FA president in downtown Miami. This place is the last stop for a number of World Cup squads. England, Honduras, South Korea, Ecuador are all in town. First, Chris Forsyth wants a pre-meeting meeting to discuss the strategy we should take with the president. Good morning, sir. You look very smart. <laughs> Right away, he says that the president has now read the contract. Uh, no, 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 no. That's why I decided to bring this meeting mm. up. The whole thing is, he's seen the contract, he's happy, he's giving it to the legal people. The contract contains a clause allowing us to organise Ghana's friendlies and permitting us to appoint the referees. That's against FIFA rules. Forsyth has some advice on how we should play things with the president. Now, if it comes up that have we done a match before, mm. we have to. I know you people don't like, but this is very critical in winning the contract. What will happen is, just tell him that you did one. Mm. We did one on a pre-season with a football club. Football so Forsyth wants us to tell a lie to help secure the deal. It was now time to meet the president of the Ghana FA, Kwesi Nyantaki, who was relaxing with Obed Nketiah in the gardens of the team's five-star hotel. Good morning to you, sir. How are you? I'm good. Hello. Just wanted to say... Hello, and to meet you. I'm supposed to meet you. The president quietly tells Forsyth he's yet to read the contract. Sure. He then looks at his tablet for some time before asking about our fictitious company. Terry follows Forsyth's advice and lies about our experience. But yeah, once. We tried once, but with a, an agent out of Romania, and it wasn't very successful. And I've been talking to uh, Chris for a while, and he suggested that he could help us moving forward in this area. The president goes on to discuss plans in detail. Yeah. But let's say 
there should be an experimental period for us to see how you do your work. Yeah. Maybe one or two, then. Yeah. But we've never seen how well you work. No, no, no absolutely. Understood. But we can I build trust. Know you. I can't. <laughs> no, no, I'm not totally if understood. Something happens and somebody asks me. But would the president sign off on the contract with that clause allowing us to appoint referees? Were you happy with the contract apart from addressing that point? Yeah, these are the issues that I go with. It. Yeah. Great. So we can work on that with a, a trial game? Yeah. Great. And we can do that first and then revisit. After a seemingly successful meeting, we could now go ahead with our plan to organise Ghana's international friendlies and fix the match by appointing corrupt referees. Yeah, and thank you for the opportunity. We'll let you get to your training session. After the president had left, Forsyth and Niketia tell us again that they need cash to get the deal running, £30,000. Well, the people are here. So okay. Once we give the money and give it to them, they say and they, they, they want it in cash. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Then I'll sort of cash out. Do you think they are taking check? Ah, no. This money is going out. Nobody needs to know it in envelope. Yeah. Envelope. Yeah. Two days later, and Forsyth and Niketia are in London. They're here for that envelope containing 30 grand we were never going to hand over the cash. Instead, we decide we are going to confront them. So there you go, Christopher Forsyth and Obed Niketia, and they're expecting quite a large sum of money, but they're going to be getting something very different. Good morning, gentlemen. I'm Morland Sanders from Channel 4 Dispatches, and you two guys have been trying to fix football matches, haven't you? This is Terry Steens, who's a match-fixing investigator. He used to work for FIFA. He's been secretly recording all of the meetings you've had over the last two months. And I'd like to get some reaction to those meetings and some of the things that you've said. First of all, did you suggest that referees could be bribed to facilitate a particular result? That is why he suggested. What did you say? Well, I said... Well, because to me, I've never done the football. I've never done a match or something like that. But I said, OK, if you want to do matches, I can help you. You I, proposed to us that I know, you could fix I, the results by bribing referees. I know nothing about football. I've never done a football match before. At the end of the day, I also, the I also, I also, I also grease their well, arms so they will do it. I because also, officials, well, when they what come, I'm you are the organiser, you listen, are the one listen, in charge of taking yeah, care yeah. of them. What I'm trying to bring to your attention over here is, he asked me and I told him, well, I can, if you want to do it, well, you can do it. But it. I will not lead you to go and do it. So, an all-out denial from Forsyth. But what would Obed Niketia have to say, a man of some standing within the Ghanaian game, both at club and international level? And you're here with the CEO of a, of a major Ghanaian team, who what? also has a position on the under-20s committee. Do you have yeah. anything to say for yourself, Mr Niketia? Yeah, 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 yeah. What he's saying is, uh, I came in because of... Uh, he wanted to organise matches for the national teams. That is what I came in for. But suggesting that referees can be bought... As for that one, I, don't, I know not to... We have well, you were in the meeting at the time. No, what, 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 what he, what, what he I said... Didn't, I didn't serve her anyway. What? You said, I take you to Selfridges and get you some nice things. You do a match for me. We know the nitty-gritty of everything. Leave it to us. It's no problem. That sounds to me like a man who's pretty involved in trying to arrange a no, fixed football. No, I have never, 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 never in my life, never done any match in my life. Never in my life have I ever done a match, a single match in my life. I'm You're not talking trying about specific to... results. If we have something going on Asia, we can decide on a 3-2. You're cheating How? and deceiving the genuine football I'm, I'm not the the one, I'm not, I'm not on the field. I'm not the one playing. So how can you tell me that I can decide the scores of the game? 
even if the match officials that are is even, what you're suggesting if, to tell i'm not i'm not i'm not are you saying that you're totally blameless in all of this yes blameless blameless in the whole thing i've never done it in my life they denied everything so far but what about the £30,000 that Forsyth had demanded, saying it was for the president of the Ghana FA and members of his emergency committee? Were you going to pay bribes to people in the Ghana FA? No, 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 no. What was that money for, then? The money for Ghana FA people. No money for them. I'm not going to pay bribe. How would they take bribe from me? What did you mean? by greasing the palms. That sounds like bunging a ref. That sounds like a bribe to me. No, that's not a bribe. What is it then? Well, I told him that if you want to do something in regards to... It's too much, it's too much. Were you planning on bribing no, the president? You can't no, no, bribe. no, 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 you can't bribe you can't him. Bribe How can you bribe him? Is it possible to bribe him? bribe him? He's a noble person. How can you bribe him? You can't bribe him. There is no way you can bribe him. You can't. In a statement to dispatches, the president of the Ghana FA said, I have not read the draft contract. I had forwarded the said draft contract to the GFA Legal Committee for advice. I have no power to approve such proposals alone as president. Nobody told me of a business deal which includes a scheme to manipulate the results of international friendly matches featuring the Ghana international football team by allowing a third party to appoint match officials whom the third party would attempt to corrupt in order to make gains through betting. The draft contract has not been approved by me or the Ghana FA. I cannot therefore be an accomplice in the breach or attempted breach of the relevant FIFA law on match fixing. I am even unaware of any such business proposal to fix matches of the Black Stars. I have no business associations with Messrs Enketia and Forsyth. I am unaware that Mr. Forsyth demanded £30,000. Neither the Emergency Committee or any of its members authorised Mr. Forsyth or any other person to solicit or receive bribes. We will ask the police to investigate this aspect of the case. So that is the end of uh, the road for our investigation into Forsyth and the Ketia. But you do hope that somebody, somewhere in football, will continue to ask questions because whatever they were up to, it is certainly not in the best interests of the game. Our investigation has revealed that global match fixers have infected all levels of the game, from non-league to the top league. And while FIFA presents a glittering climax to their prestigious tournament, the ongoing tussle with the fixers has an even more significant prize at stake, football's soul. Whatever your team, wherever they play, can you really trust what you're watching on the pitch? <laughs>